So the tweet was the parishioner would be like the person involved in a laboratory, in a research institution, and God is the truth. And if you're not there for the truth, uh, eventually the, the institution's not going to make it. It's just going to kind of dissolve because at the end of the day, if you don't have passion for research, if you don't have passion for the truth, uh, like what's the point? I don't know. England just seemed like the United States, but whiter. Uh, but by the way, can you guess my jati? Uh, well, I mean, I know you're Guju, right? Uh huh. Are you like half Patel, half Bonnie? I'm just guessing. Yeah, yeah. Did I guess right? Yeah, yeah. Th that's exactly right. <laughs> well, how did I do that? <laughs> I don't even know, man. All right. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Razib Khan. He's one of the top science bloggers in the world. Um, he writes about genetics, history, and evolution on his blog, Unsupervised Learnings. And he has a podcast of the same name. Um, and you can find it at razib.substack.com. So, uh, Razib, thanks for coming on the podcast. That was my pleasure, man. Yeah, yeah. So can, can you give my audience a little bit of background about you, uh, how you got into all this stuff? Yeah. Um, you know, I've always been interested in topics like history, uh, demographics, etc., and um i've also been interested in science have a scientific background scientific training and over the last 20 years uh genetics has become just a really big deal uh in terms of you know just as a tool to do various things whether it's in the biomedical space or historical inference and um you know so obviously i'm interested in demographics historical inference and um you know uh genetics is a tool i can use as a geneticist and so i do um, so, you know, like, uh, like, like as we're recording right now, I, um, decided to do a bunch of pairwise genetic distances between populations and stuff just cause I could for a post, you know? So, uh, you know, I, I, I do a lot of the things by myself where I replicate what's been done. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that's a lot of what I do. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right. So I, I just like to jump into it. So. Uh, my first question is, assuming there's no gene editing uh, in the near future, what is the long term equilibrium for intelligence look like? So there's like multiple visions, right? Like one one view is like, you know, Charles Murray and coming apart. You have, uh, you know, you have fat tails because there's a sort of mating. Another is there's like a slight dysgenic effect because there's lower fertility among uh, higher intelligence people. Um, so what does the equi equilibrium look like if there's no gene editing? Mm, more like the second uh, in terms of not an equilibrium yet. Uh, we're not going to have an equilibrium until, you know, the reproductive differentials equilibrate. They will at some point, you know, but it could be centuries. Um, so, like, at this point, um, people with genes for educational attainment tend to delay childbearing to the point where a lot of them do not have children, you know, uh, because they invest in educational attainment in the short term. So... You know, they don't have as many children and their generation times are longer. Like the math is so difficult there, right? Um, so uh, right now there's strong negative selection. Not strong. I mean, there's, there's negative selection on genes for educational attainment. I mean, everyone who's looked at it says that, at least in the developed world. Right. Yeah. I, is this something we can expect in the long term? Because like naively, I would expect like it, people who are more intelligent, as long as there's, you know, some sort of selection pressure in the long term. Um, you know, like th there should be selection for, um, I guess, educated, smart, uh, people because they, they will just have the cognitive tools to, uh, you know, actually, uh, reproduce, uh, or, you know, survive and thrive. Right. You, as long as like some smart people want to survive and thrive. Yeah. I mean, yeah, survive and thrive is one thing, but have a reaper, have reaper, have offspring is a different thing. Uh, you yeah. know, the incentives in our society um, are such that a lot of people believe that thriving is being child free or, you know, what usually happens, I think, is people want to establish themselves in their 20s and they don't want to put too many too much thought. I mean, at least, you know, professional managerial, you know, college educated people. And then in their 30s, they start thinking about it. And sometimes people wait too long. Uh, there's fertility issues or just they just wait too long. They can't find someone else. You know, so, um, yeah, in the, in the long term, obviously, there's a limit. There's a limiting principle, but you don't need to be that bright to, you know, survive and have a lot of children. And on the contrary, um, there's clear evidence that uh, not being bright is good for your reproductive output. So, you know. Yeah. The movie about um, that, 2006. So. 
Uh, what, the, the movie is called 2006? No, in 2006, Idiocracy. So. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, what explains the level of endogamy you see in, um, in between Indian jatis, uh, like Indian mm. subcast? Because you have a very excellent uh, blog post about this. And yeah. so the, uh, apparently, as you say, there's genetic evidence that for thousands of years, uh, these, these jatis mm-hmm. like living in the same village, you know, they're not intermarrying. They're not having mm-hmm. uh, kids together. Um, you know, even within the context of like, you know, slaves in America, this is not a thing that happens, right? Like yeah, you yeah. have Sally Hemings, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson's um, mistress. Yeah. So uh, like, I, I don't, how, how is it possible for thousands of people? What kind of social structure could lead to this? Yeah, nobody really knows uh, is a short answer. So the the math is like, you know, there's like, there's uh, evidence from from Andhra Pradesh, South India, David Reich looked at it. And it's like, if you run the math, it's like, oh, like their endogamy rate is like, you know, point, you know, it's like 99.5% per generation, like, you know, super high. So, I mean, you know, when, when I was younger, um, you know, the endogamy rate for like black Americans was like 95%, which is mm-hmm. high. And today it's like 85%, you know, but, you know, 5% is like 10 times bigger than what I'm talking about, you know? So yeah, yeah like you said, uh, average black Americans, 20% European in ancestry, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's just like, there's really high barriers in the Indian subcontinent in terms of like how it can be maintained. One thing that I, I wonder about is um, infanticide. Um, hmm. perhaps, I mean, maybe just like the social taboos, uh, reproductive fitness is really low. I don't know. I, I, it doesn't, uh, you know, for humans, it doesn't make sense, but the, the data is what it is. Um, Indians just are really good at endogamy for some reason. Um, you know, whereas in other populations, the general pattern is, um, you know, I mean, you see someone, you're like, oh, they're fine, you know. Yeah, yeah. One thing leads to another, you know. It's just, it's just like that's, you know, this isn't, uh, it's not rocket science. It's universal human nature, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> somehow Indians were able to escape that. No one, no really, no one really knows why. I mean, I've had multiple um, geneticists come up to me and be like, "What's up with this?" And I, was like, I don't know. And he's like, "Why are you asking me?" And I'm you know, like, "Well, I mean." You know, you're brown, so maybe you know. It's like they're trying to figure out whether there's a secret sauce here because it's just not, it doesn't make any sense for a uh, for a mammal where the males in particular are highly um, polygynous, right. you know, and ideal. So, I, I mean, are there any hypotheses out there about that to try to explain this? Uh, yeah, not really. I mean, you know, it's like, oh, like caste system, blah, 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 you know, but I mean, again, I mean, you know, sexual exploitation of lower caste women by upper caste men has been a thing. So I do wonder, like, what's up with that? I mean, there are some cases where you see things. So, like, uh, on the Nair, the Nair group in Kerala, um, you know, many of them, uh, many of the women, traditionally, not always, but they had these relationships with uh, Kerala Brahmins, Namathiri Brahmins, uh, that weren't marriages, but there was, like, consort. There were consorts, and, uh, you know, Carol, I think the Nairs also did polyandry and other things, but, you know, you see in the Nairs, you see, like, a very range of, like, genetic distance to not with three Brahmins, and that's just because their biological fathers, their fathers, I mean, I don't know if they call them fathers, but, you know, I mean, are of that group. So, the, the, so there are exceptions to this, um, but, you know, like, like you're telling me, yeah, like, in general, in general, I can, like, look at someone, um, most Indians and like figure out like what their community, as they say, is from, which is like not like typical, you know. Most most of like most of the world's not like that. It's basically like if if all of India is like populated by people like Ashkenazi Jews, <laughs> you know, very very endogamous oh, yeah. people. Because people are like you know people are like oh well there's no other example. And I'm like actually there is like Ashkenazi mm-hmm. Jews, the Roma who themselves are of part Indian origin. You know, there's, 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 there's a few examples. The issue is just, like, having a whole society like this is pretty weird. Yeah. Like, that is that is the, the innovation. It's like, oh, let's have a whole society that's stratified. So, you know. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Um, uh, speaking of Ashkenazi Jews, so I, I, thought, I, thought your, um, I thought your post on that was very interesting. And, you know, you talk about how, um, you know, before, before Jews were uh, kind of liberated in Europe in the 18th century, or sorry, was it 19th century? There just wasn't yeah, that early much. Early 19th. Yep. 
um, there, there, there wasn't uh, that much of an achievement. And it kind of made me wonder, are there like, are there some other uh, population groups in the world today that are uh, that were bottlenecked by a similar process um, and who are also very endogamous that, you know, once they get to a point of prosperity and uh, and liberation that Jews went through in the 19th century, you know, in the future, we'll just be talking about how they're outputting uh, a greater portion of the world's cultural heritage. Um, like, it, it, you know, like parts of the world that are just going through industrialization now and might have like small populations like Ashkenazi Jews, right? Um, yeah. Is there a potential for like a new Ashkenazi Jew in the next century or two? Is I guess what I'm asking. So what you need, so Ashkenazi Jews are highly endogamous, were. Yeah. And, um, you know, they they emerged in the context of Central East Europe as a middleman minority, um, you know, what, what the whole thing is like, you know, uh, Haredi Jews dressed like Polish nobles, you know, because... They worked for these Polish nobles as factors and tax collectors and administrators and whatnot. Um, so I guess you have to look for something like that. Um, one, you know, this isn't totally equivalent because uh, endogamy is not a big issue here, but like Fujianese, you know, uh, Chinese from Fujian have traditionally uh -huh. done better on examinations going back a thousand years, going back to the Song Dynasty. Uh, so there were like um, affirmative action quotas on people from yeah. Fujian. <laughs> So if you look at like who, so Fujian people basically, a lot of the rich Chinese, not all obviously, um, but you know, traditionally like uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the elite families are, um, you know, Shanghaiese, some Fujianese. And so like these coastal, Southeast coastal people uh, in China have traditionally been extremely enterprising and central government in China has often clamped down on them. Obviously, this government is not. Um, the modern economy cannot. And so I think these, these populations might come into their own, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although, didn't you write somewhere else that the, the Chinese government for a long time, like not just, you know, the CCP, but like, I guess China, uh, you know, in Chinese history, there's been uh, many instances of the government trying to um, get rid of like genetically distinct groups by I guess breeding them into the larger stock, so potentially that reduces the odds of some, uh, you know, outlier endogamous group. Yeah. So in China, the only equivalent, like like you see in Ashkenazi Jews, sort of the Hakka in South China, mm -hmm. and the Hakka are descended from northern Chinese migrants, and so they speak like a dialect of Mandarin, um, northern Chinese, you know, dialect in the south, like in Guangdong, uh, where the Cantonese mm -hmm. and Taishanese are. And, you know, they, they still kind of tend to intermarry. I mean, they're, they're, they're spatially isolated. But, you know, again, like, um, the Hakka, the Hakka are not like Ashkenazi Jews in, in having an ideological reason for their endogamy. Uh, you know, Chinese uh, lineages, to some extent like Indian lineages, but um, are paternal, you know. Um, so your identity and who you are, your clan is determined by who your father is. So, um, you know, that's, I mean, you might have a lower status if your mother is an ethnic minority, like Zhuang or Uyghur or something like that, but, you know, mm -hmm. informally, but still, officially, you're part of the clan. And so that's, I think, how assimilation has happened. Genetically, people in Guangdong, like the Cantonese, like, they have a minority of, um, you know, indigenous or South, South ethnic group, you know, uh, ancestry. Some of their practices are clearly not Han Chinese, especially, like, um, certain marriage practices, certain things that women do, um, and most of the gene flow is probably from females, from non from non Han that were assimilated in the area. So yeah, Han, oh, the Han identity is very assimilative. Um, uh, north of um north of the Yangtze, pretty much every Han sample that I have has a little bit of West Eurasian ancestry. South of the Yangtze, none of them have it. And so I think most of that West Eurasia is probably assimilated Mongol and other things like that. Because the Mongols In are about ten percent uh -huh. assimilated Mongol, yeah, I uh -huh. think that's what it is. Because the Mongols are about ten percent West Eurasian, uh, and the tell for me is, um, a, you know, like about one percent of Northern Chinese Han men have uh, R one A, maybe point five percent. It's not super high, but um, R one A is you know mostly found in Indo Iranians and Slavs, and Mongols have it. They have the Indo Iranian version because they assimilated Scythians and Sarmatians and other. Iranian steppe people. So I think that's probably where that comes into the Chinese. And, you know, you can go back to um, the Toba Turks and, and other groups after the fall of the Han Dynasty 
you know, 1500 or actually like 1700 years ago, 17, 1800 years ago. I mean, I think that's when they started introducing that genetic element to northern China, mm. north of the Yangtze. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. Um, by, by the way, so there's uh, going back to India, there's been a lot of talk about how uh, a lot of American CEOs of big tech companies are Indians, and specifically, uh, for you know, from Brahmin Jatis. Um, is there is there some particular reason that that that, that seems to be happening? Wait, wait, what what seems to happen? Can you repeat that again? Well, why are a lot of uh, big tech CEOs Indians, and specifically a lot of them from uh, Brahmin, uh, you know, <laughs> Brahmins? Yeah, well, the guy from TikTok's not. He's Bania. Um, uh-huh. Well, I mean, I think the, the 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 Indian explanation, which you probably know, is like Brahmins are literate. They're symbolic manipulators, um, and so obviously. You know, if you work at Microsoft or Google, um, and they tend to be particularly South Indian Brahmins, actually, uh, as opposed to North Indian Brahmins. There aren't that many of those. Um, and, and this goes back to the colonial period, actually. Um, mm-hmm. South Indian Brahmins would migrate to the cities of North India to work in the Indian civil service. You know, the reverse would not happen. So, um, you know, this is like a longstanding issue or issue or phenomenon of South Indian English speaking Brahmin elites in particular. Um, availing themselves of technology, higher education. Um, you know, Tamil Brahmins, for example, are very well represented in engineering and software, and that's obviously the pipeline that Indian Americans are going in, into as CEOs, highly overrepresented. Um, you know, so I think, um, you know, the CEO of Microsoft and CEO of Google are both South Indian Brahmins. I think they're both Telugu Brahmins. There's some there's some like debates. I think whether um, whether the guy at Microsoft uh, is a Brahmin online because I don't know. Uh, I can't tell these sorts of things. I mean, I can, but not like I don't have like a good instinct. You know what I'm saying? But um, mm-hmm. anyway, yeah. So I think Brahmins are you know like Ashkenazi Jews. You know they analogize themselves, particularly South Indian Brahmins. I think we do have to distinguish that because I you know. You know, like one of you heard about like a Guju Brahmin or a UP Brahmin, you know, it's like those people just stay where they are. You know, they're not, um, you know, they're, they're local landed elites, but they're not uh, like well known outside of the Indian subcontinent or, you know, to be honest within the Indian subcontinent from what I can see. Uh, well, what explains that? I mean, I, so I read, um, I read a part of the, he's the Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, and he, he talked about how his like, uh, da- uh, parents were like these Marxist philosophers, uh, you know, Brahmin philosophers. Um, but anyway, so, so what explains, um, what explains why these North Indians were, I guess, uh, complacent and the, these, uh, South Indians were availing themselves of, uh, you know, the, the resources. The yeah. I mean, so I think uh, in UP, UP and Bihar in particular, the elites, they tend to be. They tend to like to be big fish in small ponds, so it's uh-huh. not like there's like Rajput Thakurs all over the world either from UP, right? Uh, Punjab mm-hmm. is different. Um, there's a lot of Punjabis all over the world of various groups. Uh, you know, a lot of Jats, uh, agriculturalists, farmers in Central Valley, Khatris all over the place. You know, um, in contrast, in UP, Bihar, these North Indian states, um, there's just like there's less dynamism. Less cultural dynamism. The behavioral economic literature shows like a real strong preference for zero sum gains, um, mm-hmm. wanting to be like at the um, at the pinnacle of the local. This is not always true, you know, but they, they prefer to be at the pinnacle of the local uh, power structure rather than taking a risk going into somewhere else where they might not be at the peak. You know, they might be way well more well off in the aggregate, but. You know, they wouldn't be at the peak. And so, for example, someone like um, like Chandra Sekhar, Chandra Sekhar Limit, he's a Tamil Brahmin by background. Obviously, he settled in the United States eventually. But, um, you know, I think he was born in Lahore. His dad was working for the Indian Civil Service. And, you know, if you read his biography, they experienced, like, some kind of discrimination, you know, prejudice, being South Indians in the north. And then Chandra Sekhar went to... United States, and this is during the time of segregation, you know, and they tried to, like, put him in the Blacks-only area in St. Louis, like, for some uh, sports game. There's, like, all sorts of things that happen, you know, and then he experienced prejudice at the hands of, I think, like, Arthur Eddington, in particular, was was pretty pre- prejudiced against Indians and their ability to contribute to physics, so 
Um, is that the guy who uh, proved uh, Einstein's uh, or the yeah. uh, proved relativity right? Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think empirically. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, at least that's Chandra Sekhar's take. Like, you know, we don't know if it's like one hundred percent true that Eddington was really, a, you know, who knows? Because sometimes it turns out that there's personal beefs going on. I don't think Eddington ever told his side. He died a long time ago. Chandra Sekhar lived a, until like, wasn't it wasn't like until ten years ago. I think he died ten years ago. Yeah, I think. Oh, no, not 10 years ago. Like, 1995, so a while, though. Yeah. Yeah, 95, so Mm -hmm. 25 years ago. But, yeah, I mean, he was still, I mean, so he was still around when I was in high school. I remember someone did a report on him, and, you know, it was hard to find information back then, but, you know, you could. He was still around giving quotes, so, yeah. Um, does the work you do involve a lot of traveling? I mean, you're writing about all these different areas of the world, uh, and you know their uh, mm-hmm. um, anthropological and genetic history. Uh, I wonder if that if that requires you, or if it helps you to like just travel to all these places, or are you able to do that just from uh, just from here? No, I, just, I do most of the United States. I mean, I have traveled a little bit, but not too much. I'm not a big traveler internationally. I'm not a, you know, I'm like. Yeah, I don't, I don't do that. Um, some people do, you know. Spencer Wells, who I worked with, former boss, uh, he's you know traveled all over the world and you know with National Geographic and stuff. And that adds a lot of local color in terms of things you see, things you know. Whenever we talked about the Eurasian Steppe, he's been there a lot, so um, you know he can add a lot to that. Um, there's a few places. Um, if, if if I mean I don't know if you read the Finland series. I've been to Finland, you know. Mm-hmm. So there are certain things that I know about Finland. I've been to Finland. I've been to Italy. I don't know. England just seemed like the United States, but whiter. You know, so, <laughs> I mean, there, was, there wasn't like, ooh, like, whoa, like, I really understand the British people now. I'm just like, okay, they're drinking a lot. I, I think I I think I am not surprised by that, just judging by, you know, like all those British sitcoms and TV shows where they're, like, drinking in the morning. I get it now, you know, so. Huh. Yeah, so that's that's one thing I was wondering is uh, knowing all that you know about uh, the history of these different places. Do you feel that uh, when you visit a place or when you learn more about a place, you're like, oh, I, I, what they're doing today that makes sense to me? Like, why why it is the way it is, given what I know about you know the the yeah. roots of what, what happened in that place thousands sometimes, of years ago? Sometimes. Or does it feel that it's just kind of random? No, it's not random. Sometimes you do. I mean, they, there's sometimes where it's like. You know, someone does this or their family does this. And I'm like, oh, it's because of this. And they're like, what? Oh. You know, like they don't, because you don't know the antecedents of, you know, we don't know the antecedents of everything we do. And so a lot mm-hmm. of times I do. And, you know, I mean, the thing was like, you know, for example, like um, Americans are really ignorant in geography. So uh, um, so 2019, I'm a scientific conference in American Society of Human Genetics. You know, I'm meeting these people, you know, you're just networking, you're meeting. Um, so I met this uh, Chinese geneticist. Uh, she's, I think she's in grad school in the United States, and I was like, oh, like, where are you from? She was just like, oh, I'm from a city between Beijing and Guangdong, like exactly in the middle. Okay, so here's my, my train of thought. Uh, so I immediately blurred out Wuhan. And she was like, whoa, how'd you guess that? You know? Okay, so one, she was shocked that I knew what Wuhan, that I knew of Wuhan, right? Because most uh-huh. Americans don't. Two, Shanghai's in the middle, but if she was from Shanghai, she would say Shanghai. So it had to be another city. I happen to know that there's a high-speed line, rail line between um, Beijing and Guangdong, uh, between Guangzhou, and uh, its, its middle point is Wuhan. So I knew Wuhan was exactly in the middle, right? And so I was like, you know, these are the sort of things. I mean, it's like, ooh, like an American. It's like super amazing because we don't know any geography. Like her friend was like, you know, I was, like, looking at him. I was like, oh, you're, you're pretty tall. Like, you know, are you from North China? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm from the East. And I'm like, Shandong. And then he was just like, whoa, how'd you know that? And I'm like, what's well, the easternmost province? I mean, I mean, it's just an educated... Do you know what I'm saying? If someone's, like, someone's mm-hmm. like uh, has, like, um, they're talking about chowder, you know, and drinking tonic. And uh-huh. it's, like, wicked smart. And I'm just like, are you from Boston? They're like, whoa, <laughs> that's wicked crazy. How'd you know that? And I'm just like, uh... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But it's because because I know, like, everybody outside of America rightfully assumes that Americans do not know anything about where they're from. Like, nothing. You yeah. know? And so it's just, like, an incredible party trick with an American accent to be like, <laughs> you are from Praha. You know? They're like, what? You know? 
<laughs> uh, but by the way, can you guess my Jati? Uh, well, I mean, I know you're Guju, right? Uh huh. But I, I couldn't, I didn't guess it. Um, I don't know it by the name. I mean, you look, uh, are you like half Patel, half Bonnie? I'm just guessing. Yeah, yeah. Did I guess right? Yeah, yeah. Th- that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> How did I do that? I don't even know, man. <laughs> but my mom, my, my dad, uh, my, 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 yeah, my dad is Patel and my mom is uh, Mania, yeah. Okay, all right. That, uh, that's I exactly mean, correct. Okay, guys, um, <laughs> this was not a conspiracy between us. Like, he literally, right. like, just, I, I didn't know that question was going to be asked, and yeah. I actually didn't have any. I just, like, looked at him, and I was just like, mm, this is my guess. This is my yeah. educated guess. Right, right. So that alone should justify your subscription. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I, I've had this question about, um, you know, the, the greater ma- male variance uh, theory uh, for a long time, which is that, um, you, so the, basically the idea is um, um, men produce more geniuses, but also more idiots. Yeah. Um, so I've always wondered, like, um, why is that the case? Because you would, so is, is there some, there must be some mechanism that like just increases the variation, um, like, you know, gives you a higher odds of being a genius, but at the cost of higher odds of also being an idiot. Um, that is like more activated in men, right? Like, wh- wh- why? Wh- what is the trade off that um, involves? Uh, if you activate this trade off, you might be, have a higher odds of becoming a genius, but also a higher odds of becoming an idiot. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you got to like BS a little bit about the molecular mechanism, or like I haven't looked at it in detail in a while, but one of the hypotheses is, for example, we have one X chromosome. So, with X chromosomes, normally with women, um, there's uh, inactivation of one X mm-hmm. chromosome randomly in the cell, right? Or in the tissue or whatever, in the tissue region, bar bodies, right? So every cell has an X chromosome and they tend to clump where it's like, they're these like bar bodies, like X chromosomes that are inactivated. They're not expressing. They're like, they're like euchromatic. Okay. People are going to be like, Oh my God, like he's getting euchromatic and heterochromatic mixed. I was getting mixed up. Okay. I'm not a molecular geneticist, but anyway, um, so like one of the X chromosomes has to inactivate and that's random. Okay, so let's say a um, woman has like a major mutation in the X chromosome. You know that like she has another copy, right? But you know it could be that in that cell there's a malfunction because the other copy is the one that's inactivated, the one that's functional. Now, if you're a man, there's no choice. It's only one X chromosome, mm-hmm. right? So obviously that's limiting the degrees of freedom, right? And so if that's a good copy, if it's got some good stuff going on there, well, that's good. But if it's got bad stuff going on there, well, you're you're screwed. So, I mean, the easiest explanation for why the, at the low end men have problems is probably, okay, well, we have a load of deleterious alleles on our X chromosomes that uh. are not masked because we only have one of them, right? So that's one thing. Um, in terms of we are the heterogametic sex... So we're the sex that has like so in in birds I think it's the opposite or I know it is the opposite. Um, females are the heterogametic sex. The sex determination happens through them, and males have like the equivalent of two X's. I think it's Z W, and I think the males are Z Z. Anyway, um, so that's one issue. And when you think developmentally, you know we all start out as females. The female is the template. Um, Uh, And so men have to go through extra processes. So the end of life is the opposite. Like women go through menopause, which is a proactive physiological shutdown, not just like a long, slow decline like we go through in our reproductive processes. But at the beginning of life, I think it's the end of the first trimester, we go through this testosterone burst, right? SRY, the sex, um, you know, uh, you know, the sex chromosome, you know, the sex determining region kicks in. And we become male, we become masculinized. So when you have a situation when you have extra developmental steps, hey, guess what? That can mess things up, okay? So we also have higher testosterone. Testosterone is antagonistic to immune response. Um, So there are more males born than females, probably because the Y chromosome of the male, the the sperm of a male Y chromosome is lighter than when it has an X chromosome, okay? So probably male sperm, quote, male sperm, have an advantage in speed. There's about 104, 105 males born for 100 females. But in utero, there's a strong suspicion from people that have done, like, sampling on um, 
miscarriage, miscarried fetuses, that males are overrepresented. So we actually start out with a bigger advantage. And we're already culled because of our genetic abnormality. Something on the order of like 10 to 50% of fetuses miscarry. Um, it's still kind of uh, not clear with the total numbers because it's really hard to track miscarriages early on, right? Um, and mm-hmm. so so that, that explains, like, I think the, the downward, the low end. In terms of why there might be more male, quote, geniuses, I think the way you might want to look at it is there's really no reproductive value at the high end. It's just kind of like a freak thing. And um, if we're less developmentally stable, uh, we can go off target a little bit more is the way I think of mm. it. There's no reason you need you need to have your IQ be like once. There's no reason you need to be able to do algebraic topology easily. Okay. Yeah. There's, just, there's no reason. And there, there is some evidence. There is some evidence in the genomic literature now with the most recent work that there is some enrichment for schizophrenia and other things with some of these educational attainment genes. Like mm-hmm. some, there's, there's some evidence. Yeah, but is there some reason in the um, ancestral environment why, I don't know, having a brain capable of algebraic topology would be advantageous? Like, is there something that a uh, human would need to do? Okay, and then uh, it, 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 a separate question, I guess, uh, you can answer at the same time. It, 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 do we have an explanation for why brain size decreased by, uh, like, uh, what was it, uh, what, was 10% or something like that? Something as, like after the yeah, it, we're just smaller. So our, our bodies yeah. got smaller. Like it got, When it got warmer, we got smaller, but also agriculture seems to have given us really, really weak bones. We got mm-hmm. more fragile, more gracile. We shrunk some with agriculture, and so that natural process of that is smaller brains. I bet you average nutrition probably decreased some in, in terms of like quality as opposed to reliability and consistency. That probably meant that you know smaller brain sizes are more optimal to survive uh, through the affairment. I mean, we know smaller body sizes are, for mm-hmm. sure. Um, we know small, smaller body sizes are. Um, there's been a lot of negative selection uh, in Southern Europe and in Asia for small body size. And um, last I checked, it seems pretty clear that people in the eastern part of the Indian subcontinent are shorter genetically. I mean, some of it is like East Asian ancestry, but like, I mean, just clearly like Bengalis are just a short people, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. if you just like meet like people from Bangladesh or West Bengal in the West and like they're chubby AF cause they get a lot to eat. So it's not like genetics, you know, like I used to, when uh. I was or not, or not genetics, but like environment, I used to, like, I was like, when I was little, people would say like, oh, well, you know, people, people, you know, your, your parents, cause my dad's short, your, your parents didn't eat a lot of meat. And I was just like, okay. But like, now that I know about genetics, nutrition and class background, I'm like, no, like my my family, like, like, you know, like, people were, like, obese in my family. Like, they had enough to eat. They didn't suffer yeah. from the Bengal famine. And also, my family is Muslim, so they eat beef. I mean, they got protein. No, they're just short because genetics, you know? And why? Well, we know the, Bangla- the Bengali population is Bangladesh. They have cholera resistance, obviously, because, you know, the issues with flooding and water. Um, that's different than other South Indian, uh, Indian subcontinental populations. I, I, there's some reasons why they're small, too. I don't know why, why, why Bengalis are small, but that's obviously true. Oh, so, so sorry. What's the link between cholera and uh, height or cholera? Oh, there's no link. I'm height? just saying like there's been studies in selection. Uh, uh-huh. There's selection for resistance to cholera in Bengal. Uh-huh. It's one of the canonical examples, like the Vibria, whatever, like that, the, uh, the microbe. There's clearly strong selection because of the cholera uh, over the last couple of centuries. Yeah, and then what do you make of the self-domestication hypothesis? The idea that there's like a, a there's a set of genes that um uh, th- I guess yeah. th- they happen together. Th- they're associated in many different mammals with um um domestication. You know, like smaller mm-hmm. uh, jaws, um males and females uh looking yeah. uh, similar, and then you know uh, less intelligence. There, there's a cluster of other things, but so basically the idea is that the same thing happened to humans during the agricultural revolution. What do you make of that idea? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a plausible. I think um um it hasn't really um. Uh, uh, um, it hasn't really panned out in terms of the genomics. Let's just put it that way. Because this hypothesis has been around for a generation, and it hasn't really panned out in terms of the genomics. So um, I guess what I would say is, like, um, it could be that, uh, um, and uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, what I would say is it could be humans are special in some distinct ways, okay? Um, 
because because like the, the it's been studied in foxes and other organisms extensively, but um, it hasn't been and and dogs, you know. And there's a spackling and some of the things. Let's talk about what you're talking about. Like there's certain like spackling patterns, um, floppy ears, just really really common patterns across mammals because the same developmental pathways are are tuned. We obviously don't have fl floppy ears and we don't show piebald patterning, so. Um, I think this. I think it's a great idea. I just don't know for sure, like how it, how it operationalizes in humans. Let's put it that way. I mean, it's been okay. it's been a generation. We have genomic resources, and it hasn't really. I haven't seen too much advancement in that direction. Gotcha. Um, okay, so this morning you tweeted. Um, if everyone who attends a church thinks that the point of church is to bask in the war of the fellow parishioners rather than worshiping God, the church won't last long. And then you follow, follow yeah. that up uh, with a tweet that said, uh, uh, in parentheses, I'm not talking about religion. So I, I genuinely don't know uh, what, what you're uh, what you're referring in that tweet. I, I don't know if you meant, meant to keep it uh, unsaid, but I was just kind of curious. Yeah, I was being stressed and I was just having a discussion. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what it was. I was having a discussion with a scientist friend of mine. We were talking about collegiality. Uh, mm -hmm. and truth, and, um, you know, it's like sometimes, sometimes it seems like in science today, um, and it's just not just online, but just in general, uh, you know, like the community, um, and just like, you know, comfort, I guess, uh, I don't know, is like prioritized. And, and a lot of it's fake, uh, you know, science is like, is like, um, is like, uh, it's like uh, it's like management consulting. It's up or out, you know. So all this stuff about like support and it's just fake, right? Yeah. Like one percent of one percent of incoming graduate students will have like a tenured R one, research one, right. like top research one position, like you know, a relevant one, right? So yeah. all this stuff about how we're here to support you, no, like we're here to like separate the wheat from the chaff. So that's kind of like fake right there. But you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, just kind of the community and not making people uncomfortable and inclusion and equity. And I'm just like, science is like super inequitous, right? It's not like, it's not like, um, it's not like pediatrics or something, right? Yeah, there are superstar pediatricians, but look, the average pediatrician makes a difference and a pediatrician's a pediatrician. In science, it, you have like a few superstars who, I mean, like it's hyper Pareto principle, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's not like the 2080, it's like, you know, the 5 to 95, you know? So, um, anyway, it's just like a little strange there. And, um, you know, the whole idea is like truth. And, you know, I've, you know, I'm, I, I've just seen things where it's like, oh, like people are like, that's just uncomfortable. You can't say that. That makes people blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, like, one, it's a very, very winnowing profession. They haven't changed that, no matter what you say. Like, you can repeat these mantras, but it doesn't matter. Like, it's a winnowing profession. And the other thing is, um, you know, like, I thought science was here for the truth. Like, if that's not the primary focus, if you're here for, like, quality of life, well, you know, I, I don't know. Like, well, why are we funding it then? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. It, it's not only unequal in the sense that uh, there's like a logic curve where a small minority of scientists make the largest, uh, much larger portion of the total uh, contribution to science, but it's also unequal. I think it was you who said this or wrote about this. I, I don't know where I saw this, but um, professors, uh, the career professorship has the highest um, heredity in the sense that the, the, the highest correlation between the parent being a yeah. professor yeah. and the child being a professor. Yeah. I, yeah. I, was that you? Yeah. Uh, I didn't, I mean, I probably retweeted it. I mean, that's not, that's uh -huh. obvious. I didn't talk about it extensively because I was like, okay, everyone knows this. Everybody uh -huh. in science knows this. My right. dad was a professor, by the way. But anyway, uh, I'm not, <laughs> but I'm just saying that like everybody who, so um, one thing is, so I have a friend, uh, like I have you know, so people in science, people who go into graduate school in science, academic science, they, you know, reason first generation is a thing is because it's so skewed toward professional managerial class people in general. It's very, very class biased. You know, um, so, yeah, anyway, it's very class biased, but even people who come from professional managerial uh, backgrounds, if they didn't come from academia, they don't always know everything. So I have a friend who came from, like, very upper upper middle class background, and, you know, he admitted, like, yeah, like, he had to learn some things in terms of what you do um, to, to make it in science. 
because you know his i think his dad's a lawyer i don't remember i think his dad's a lawyer but you know so he knows i mean it's the same thing in medicine like i have a friend who's in medicine i think his parents are engineers and you know he's he said that they told him for medical school interviews it's going to count against you that your parents aren't doctors because they just assume you don't mm. know as much about like how to make it in the profession right and so mm. there's tacit stuff that, that gets passed on like i have a friend he's um he is a research one professor. He does have tenure. I mean, he has succeeded, but he comes from a very working class background. And by the time he got to the postdoctoral fellow stage, which is after PhD, before professor, uh, he was like talking to people and they were talking about their choices that they made as undergrads and blah, blah, blah. And he just thought to himself, and you know, he's, um, he's in like in his field, he's in a top 10 institution. He's not at like Harvard, but he's in a top. So he's doing really well. So I don't want to under undersell how, how much he's accomplished. But, you know, he literally told me, he was like, you know, I just thought to myself, I was like, I never had a chance. You know, because he just, I mean, he did well, obviously, but like he never planned this way. He never optimized his own life because he just, I mean, he didn't have that background, you know? Yeah. He was just like thought to himself, he never had a chance. So, um, you know, that is what it is. On the margin, um, it makes a big difference. And I think this is why there's a lot of virtue signaling from some people um, who, you know, like some of the most, um, what is it? There's a, like, there's a professor, I'm not going to name who it is explicitly, but people who follow academic Twitter probably know who I'm talking about. Um, they work in biomedical science and, you know, they do periodic virtue signaling. Uh, just like standard progressive stuff. Uh, but like, I think their uncle was like a Nobel Prize winner and they did research in their uncle's lab when they were in high school. So, I mean, this is a person who got a huge leg up by family. I mean, they're smart. Yeah. Okay. But okay. Like they knew exactly how to succeed in science because they had all the family connections in the world. And, um, you know, so now I think they overcompensate. I think she overcompensates, to be honest. That's what everyone assumes privately. That's what they say. And I think it's probably true. You know, there's other people like that where, um, you know, online, there's a couple, there's, there's, there's one guy online who's like super, super progressive, but a friend of mine told me he's like a notorious dick um, to his, to people in his lab, where it's like, he's just like, he's a really bad boss. He's really mean, really demanding. So obviously he's just covering his butt, like on social media. So anyway, like my tweet was basically alluding to the fact that like, well, if you're not there for the right reasons, if everyone's just there to like collect a salary or they don't know what to do with their life, um, or like they like hanging out with this crew and being on the same, like, I don't know, ideological team kind of like, okay, like, I mean, what is the, what is the point of science then? You know, what is the point of where, why are you here? Why aren't you an accountant or, or a CPA or something like that? I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You know, um, you're supposed yeah. to be here for a higher calling. Uh, and so, okay, so the tweet was the parishioner, the par parishioner would be like the person involved in a laboratory, in a research institution, and God is the truth. And if you're not there for the truth, uh, eventually the, the institution's not going to make it. It's just going to kind of dissolve because at the end of the day, if you don't have passion for research, if you don't have passion for the truth, uh what's the point yeah you know? yeah um there's this professor uh, we both know but uh, obviously i'm not gonna say who it is um and so his um his 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 kids uh, also want to become uh professors so it, it, the, um uh the 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 kid uh they um just graduated uh high school and then so they had a, a peer-reviewed published paper while they were in high school, because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously the professor had guided, uh, guided them so that they would be in a good position to become a professor uh, themselves, right? So mm -hmm. when you consider that kind of advantage and somebody who just goes into college, like, oh, this subject seems interesting to me, maybe I should consider a graduate uh, academic career here. Obviously, there's like no comparison in, the, in, in just the level of advantage you have if, you, if you've been planning it out uh, like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on here. Um... I've talked to multiple friends who are like in postdoc level and they just talk about like they can see over the last 10 years a massive inflation in publication where their postdocs now and like some of their graduate students have like two or three publications coming in mm -hmm. and like they didn't have any publications until their like third, fourth year of graduate school and they went to the same university. So what's happening here? Um, you know, and we... I mean, you know this, like, okay, like, in the past they didn't publish as much, but they did a lot of science. So this is, this is like one of those issues when you devise a metric, 
to measure yeah. something, eventually the metric gets distorted, right? It's just like a truism. Right. The metric's getting distorted. There are people who are like producing. I mean, look, I mean, some of these researchers who are like, who have like 30 papers a year, what, what, what? You know, I mean, you're not <laughs> contributing, you're just, you're not really contributing to it, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's like, uh, there's like full time bloggers who don't output as many blog posts as you are outputting papers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, uh, yeah yeah um okay so within the spheres that i travel in maybe that you travel in as well on like ea adjust and stuff there's this idea that we are living in uh like a very important time in history and then there's like um there's like a step function right so that you have like different steps like agriculture domestication metallurgy mm -hmm. um ind industrialization and like we're at another step right now um so I, I, from all the people I know, you you know the most about history, especially ancient history. Um, so, do you view history as a sort of um, a, a series of step functions, each one the newest one more important than the last, or do you view it as just like a sort of a gradual exponential curve? Like, what is your view of mm -hmm. your long view of history? I think it's mostly gradual. Uh, we we reify it into a step, but I think we might actually be in a step now. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the slope is steep enough, it's a step, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we might be at a step now, um, and there have been steps in the past, but mostly we reify. So the Industrial Revolution, my understanding from economic history, is, is really more gradual and exponential uh, than, like, quote, revolution. Agriculture was probably like that as well. Uh, Peter Turchin's work with some of his collaborators indicates that the Axial Age was actually more gradual. Um, some of the coalescing of ideas, it wasn't like a step within one century, you know, around 600 BC or whatever. So, um, you know, th this is just a situation where most of the time, I think we, we tend to like simplify it as a step, but you know, um, you know, right now we live in an age of miracles that we don't take for granted because, you know, me, you, everybody, we're just, we're just scrambling, you know, we have supercomputers in our pockets. They're called phones, you know, we're doing, you know, science fictional video stuff and uh my kids uh who are like my oldest kid is say 10 my youngest is like five right something like that so they're they're a little dubious about this idea sometimes you use the phone uh for these non-video calls and they're very confused why people would do that and they're very skeptical of this idea that that's what this phone was actually originally designed for <laughs> <laughs> you know so i mean like yeah. this is to the point where it's like okay like and like also like they um they see a flip phone and they're very confused with how that could be a phone like what is this ancient technology from 2007 you know so mm -hmm. it's just like you know because we have like a like a lot of people we have like a desk full of phones old, old phones that we never threw away because of whatever right um and so like you know my my kids saw the phone and they were like what is this thing and like it's cool, and they're like, I'm like, oh, that's a phone, and they're like, no, but a phone's a square, you know. <laughs> and um, they have an old rotary like f toy phone. Um, they tr traditionally use it as a hammer, you know. It's just like they don't really know what the the form factor. It's totally like weird for them. So you know, um, we are living through a radical change in terms of, you know, like our social technology or information technology, like most of your viewers probably know Kurzweil, information technology is exponential. Yeah. So there are some radical changes going on right now, and we need to um, think about what that means, because I think we're like, you know, I mean, VR is going to be a big deal. So I, I, I have said, like, I did say 20 years ago, probably, because um, we, again, like, you know, I know people hope Holden will be okay with me saying that. I've known Holden for 15 years, you know? Uh, Holden Karnofsky, I think he's, mm -hmm. you know, might be one of the people you're talking about, about this century. Yeah, and I've yeah. said, like, this might be, like, the last century of humans in a way that we would recognize, or it might be a century of regression. I, I think that we are in a metastable state right now where, I mean, I'm looking at you right now, and you look like, like a primate, you know, and you are a primate. You know, yeah. but like you have access to all this technology. Like, what's going on? You know Me what I'm especially, saying? or <laughs> no, just in general. Like, I, I look at myself. I know, I when know. I see myself, I don't see a primate. I see Razib. You know what I'm saying? But uh -huh. if you look at another person, it's just like really, really like you know. You think about it, it can be really, really visible. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's really really visible uh that um and that you're an animal of like that particular lineage, you know. I mean, when you look at right. it, it's like, oh, you see way way they move, you know. You think about it. so, like, how long is this going to persist? Like, we obviously evolved during the Pleistocene, even earlier, with a lot of our instincts. Now we have like the ability to destroy the world, our civilization. Like, we're not going to exterminate all life on Earth. Like, that's just you know probably not even all humans. You know, there's probably going to be people in the southern hemisphere for sure that are going to survive, but it, we destroy our civilization. And civilizations have destroyed in the past, have been destroyed in the past um, by, you know, overreach, you know, but those civilizations had like local collapses, local regressions. And then they mm-hmm. got like more, we got more robust with Samaburya would call social technology, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, you see the Chinese dynastic cycle uh, it keeps shrinking every single time in terms of the chaotic interregnum. So, one, that means that the previous dynasty was. Its institutional structure is probably more robust to shocks, and then it can rewind itself back up uh, relatively easily, right? So, like the first big, um, first big unwinding is the Zhao Dynasty doesn't really count, but let's do the Zhao. That's like five hundred years decline, here to Warring States, and then the Han, you know, the the Qin Han Dynasty. Then there's like like a three hundred year period of collapse, and then there's like like a 150-year period of collapse, you know, it just keeps shrinking every single time. And so showing you that, like, cultural or social technology is getting better, information technology is getting better. But now we're global. And so like, even if there's, like, a 50-year collapse, I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we're going to lose, you know. And, you know, Samo and others have talked about the fact that, like, we can't make rockets the way we could 50 years ago because a lot of those engineers are not, you know, and our military runs on like COBOL, COBOL software that barely anyone can read. It's like cuneiform, you know. So it's like the Babylonians. Like we laugh at them for like two thousand years or th- oh, fifteen hundred years, two thousand years after the last native Sumerian speaker died, they were using Sumerian liturgy, you know. But we are going to have a situation soon where there's going to be almost no COBOL programmers, but we have COBOL software base, and so people are going to have to like you know, train and, like, learn from these manuals, these ancient texts from the 1970s, uh, how to... I mean, it's not, like, that difficult. It's feasible. But the issue here is, like, a timing and time um, because you might not have enough programmers to service all the code that you have. Like, So these, these are real issues that I think we have to deal with as primates who've organically developed this technological system and are trying to figure out um, how to make it work. Yeah, yeah. Sustain, and, um, sustain. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I had Samo on just a little while back to discuss exactly these topics. So for the listeners who are interested, I, definitely check out that episode. Yeah, and even with something like, um, you know, COBOL or software engineering, like as somebody started, uh, started coming to your science, like even something that's that legible, you know, you can have a sort of implicit knowledge from previous programmers or like how, how does the entire system work? And, you know, this is like literally written word, right? <laughs> that's what a program is. So that's super legible. Compare that to other forms of manufacturing. I, uh, I know a guy who worked at a, a fertilizer plant. And, you know, he, maybe I shouldn't say this on air, but he, he basically said, like, if somebody did something to this fertilizer plant, that's like, OK, that's a famine right there. Right. <laughs> then mm-hmm. we're, we've, we, we've lost uh, the source of nitrogen here. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah. Uh, um, Oh, so uh, uh, going back to you made a very interesting comment about like we're at a point where we're u- using our computers to do magic, but the person behind that computer is a primate. Um, so do you see, uh, knowing what you know about genetics and uh, the potential malleability of our genetics, do you see the future iteration as um, as us adding on to or modifying or selecting on the same biological substrate? Or do you see the future iteration? Do you think it's more feasible that we just move on to uh, entirely virtual, um, we're like M's living on computers. Like, which seems more feasible to you? I mean, it would be ironic if we're a simulation that uploads ourselves into a computer. But anyway, I don't want to get into that, you know? <laughs> I don't want to get into that. Um, what seems more feasible? I think in the, in the, in the okay, like, the biological program of, re, of redoing ourselves, I think, is, like, actually... It's not straightforward in terms of, like, you know, minimal risk. There's going to be a lot of false starts, which is going to be kind of crazy. But I do think people will improve themselves, okay? I think they, they will edit themselves better uh, over the next century. Um, and But I think that there's going to be 
some integration with brain computer interfaces. Yes, I do. I mean, I haven't like followed it closely, but you know, I, I do move in some of the similar circles and I think, you know, brain um, technology interfaces are going to be a big deal. And I think they're going to really change the game. And I think that's going to be, um, but, but the issue there is like, so I guess I think of gene editing, to be honest, more as like Smithian growth, where it's like, you know, increased efficiencies. Cause we have the genetic variation now. Like we can make him smarter. We have the technology. Okay, like we're not we're not there yet. I can see that though. I mean, we can all like understand the basic logic there. Like there is John Ma- John von Neumann existed. The experiment has been done. Yeah. So we can aspire to create like a bunch of von Neumanns. Okay, that's great. Now the issue is like um, with with like with the with the human computer interfaces. That's never been done, right? So that is um that is like a, an innovation. That's like, you know, uh, technology driven growth that's increasing like the baseline productivity by like crazy amount. Like that's that could be the possible quantum leap. So um mm-hmm. <coughs> excuse me. Um that could be a big deal, uh, in a good way or a bad way. And I think a lot of your listeners know about all the existential risk crisis and artificial you know, like we talk about like, you know, hostile AI and general artificial intelligence and all this stuff, but I mean I mean perhaps it'll start with us. You know, perhaps Skynet will be some uploaded crazy kid, you know, where it's like, because some, maybe it's going to be a situation where it's like, it's like going to the new world where, you know, there were attempts to go to like, to the new world. They didn't know the new world was there, but there were people in the middle ages who left for the West and they never, obviously the ships just disappeared. You know, they died, you know, they died. At sea, right? So there's going to be people who do things like going to Mars. There's going to be high for mortality rates, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, similarly, with like these human computer interfaces, there's going to be high death rates. Like just basically, people just disappear into the ether. But then the first person that gets in there, it's going to be like Christopher Columbus, or you know, it's going to be a situation where they may be like actually like a very very advantageous position. Instead of being a primitive prototype, they might like basically have all the quote unquote land in the cyberspace, right? Where it's like they do all the learnings really early on. They iterate, they pivot, and so they can be like, you know, the god of that universe. I don't know. I'm just speculating here. But I'm trying to say that like I think the possibilities there are like pretty extensive, pretty high variance. Mm-hmm. And in the short term, what is the landscape of um uh just I guess gene editing, polygenic selection, what does that look like in the next ten to twenty years? So I mean is there a potential that you know you could like raise your kid's IQ by one or two standard deviations, um, or are, are these going to be like uh, marginal uh, marginal improvements? Like, uh, oh, I, by the time I'm ready to have yeah. kids, what will it look like? Yeah, well, I think with gene editing, the intelligence thing is going to be like 20 years. Let's say 20 years, okay? Like, I think in the short term, yeah. what gene editing really will do is will probably cure cystic fibrosis, clear sickle cell. Like, these are like Mendelian quasi Mendelian diseases with large effect loci. And people are just have issues. And so, you know, there's always a delivery problem. There's always a problem with off-target effects, which could cause mutations, could cause cancers. But, you know, if you're cystic fibrosis, you're going to be dead by 45. Like, you're going to take the risk, right? So I think like, that's mm-hmm. honestly going to be the first thing. The first thing is going to be transfection or, like, you know, gene editing of adults uh, for Mendelian diseases. So that's the next 10 years, okay? It's already happening now. Uh, they're already curing people of, of malaria or sickle cell. And I think they're working literally right now as we record on cystic fibrosis and ALS, you know, Uh, because they're just degenerative diseases that kill people in the prime of their life lives. Um, But, you know, 20 years, that's a long time. Um, You know, we have 40 year old IVF babies now, you know, I think almost 40. But uh, so I I think 20 years, yes, you will start to see parents editing the genes of their offspring um i think intelligence is like difficult um because it's a polygenic trait um with a lot of a lot of different genomic positions i wonder if they're going to go for other things first and then kind of work to it and then you know there's that theory that you know armand Leroy was was talking about it but other people is like it's not like what you should do is focus for like uh focus uh, on mutations and other things, try to fix those and see if that just inadvertently like increases the, you know, mm, intelligence. Interesting. Rather than focusing on getting gain of function genes, which is like, okay, like how do you identify those? Uh, fix all of your copy errors. Uh, Cause that's a finite number. Look at, compare to the pedigree of the parents, look at the de novo mutations, look at the parents de novo mutations against the idealized reference. 
et cetera, et cetera. That might be much more feasible. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know about yeah. that. Do you have an estimate for how many SNPs uh, affect the variation in intelligence between people? Uh, let's see. Um, how many SNPs? Ooh, okay. or like I think it's going to yeah. be an order of thousands. Um, just, okay. just, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So just just some meta questions to close out on. So yeah. um, you, you've uh, you know you you distinguished yourself uh, in your career by being somebody who who's like an expert in history and an expert in genomics and life sciences more generally. Um, are there other fields where you think uh, knowledge of history would be very useful in setting up like a separate niche? Because like you you have a niche in history and genomics, um, but you know it would be hard to imagine, for example, somebody mm. knowing a lot about history and computer science having a special niche, right? Yeah. Like, so what, what, what good is history there? Yeah, cultural evolution. That's what Joe Henrik and some of his people are wanting, uh -huh. wanted to do. Um, yeah. So I think um, I think like in cultural evolution, there's going to be a lot of gains because, uh, you know, Peter Turchin, Joe Henrik, these people are applying evolutionary principles to historical processes. And to have the empirical data set, um, um, uh, it, it, to have the empirical data sets really important and this is a really new nascent field so i think that that's going to be the big thing that i would think people should focus on um peter said like oh like getting anthropology knowledge and i'm like i i, I don't think the short-term knowledge is super important i think having a like, deep deep not deep thick knowledge about historical arcs um uh, would probably be pretty useful yeah hmm interesting interesting and, but, I mean, Joe, um, Joe and his group are—they're working in that. They're—they're they're moving into history. They're going—they're doing some serious imper imperialism that's causing problems. Yeah. Ca causing problems? How? Yeah. Uh just historians do not like the turf, turf infringement. That's what I'm saying. I so, see. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Um, and you, so you—you're—you're you're one of the top bloggers on Substack, and you have this like deeply technical blog on you know the science of genomics and other things. Um, you know that, that that's like uh, you you would think beforehand that your prior would be like oh like how many people are going to be able to understand this or be interested in this but in fact you're you know you're one of the top people on Substack like what has the experience of that been like and like has it surprised you the popularity of your work and everything? Uh, honestly, no. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it surprised. Okay, I'm going to be honest. It probably surprised me like how many people are willing to pay, but people have been reading me for a long time, so I just mm. kind of like professionalized it some um and uh yeah um it's it's been great uh and uh it's really like helped me figure out what people are interested in in terms of what they're willing to pay for and uh you know it's it's given me some direction i guess but um i'm i plan to do i basically do what i continue to have done in various ways in the past into the future and um you know like thinking of startup world uh way i would pivot and iterate is what is what i'm thinking Mm. And yeah. final question: Do you have any advice for people who like want to write about technical topics uh, in a way that's like very interesting to a broad audience? Uh, okay, so you have to make it relevant to them somehow. So, for example, uh, like let's say you want to write about signal detection. Um, I mm -hmm. think like you know um, text to speech type stuff like, is one. Of, there, there, there are things people are super interested in. So, for example, people were super interested in Ashkenazi Jewish genetics. Uh, people are super interested in the genetic architecture of skin color. I mean, okay, why? I can talk about the genetic architecture of, like, I don't know, something else, you know? Uh, and it wouldn't be as super interesting. So you, you have to find the domain that they're interested in and then apply your method, right? Mm. So if you're interested in... So, actually, there's a, a substack on personality... Uh, I think, Per, that talks about personality and using um, machine learning methods to classify personality. Okay, mm. machine learning is technical, but personality is interesting. Right, so. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's good advice. All right, Rajiv. Uh, yeah, th thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for your time. This is a lot. Of that fun. was my pleasure. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, and you want to help support the podcast. The most helpful thing you can do is share it on social media and with your friends. Other than that, please make sure to like and subscribe and click here for more content like this. Huge thanks to my co-founder, Grayson Roucher, for producing the show. I'll see you next time. Peace.